Well, luckily for us, they haven't gone to bed just yet. And we've got a pair of the most tolerant dwarf mongoose I've actually ever encountered on foot. They seem to be completely comfortable with us. Oh, excuse me, Impala. They make the silliest sounds when they're rutting. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know we're looking at the dwarf mongoose, but the Impala nearly ran into Herbie. <laughs> they just they, there's just dust all around him. <laughs> they came speeding past. Oh my goodness. You okay there, Herbs? <laughs> right, sorry, we're still looking at the dwarf mongoose. <laughs> I thought Herbie was gonna get to be the first person to be clapped by an impala running past. We're still without dwarf mongoose. Look at this. The little chap is not only comfortable enough with us to be out of the termite mound, but is also comfortable enough to be enjoying the afternoon sun, soaking up the last bit of warmth before the sun starts to go down. And I want to try something. I mean, I've tried this with the wildebeest uh, with outrageous success in getting a little bit closer to them, habituating to them, on, uh, to them to us on foot. But one of the things I've always wished I could do if I had more time in the mornings or the afternoons would be to actually sit with one business of dwarf mongoose or one group of dwarf mongoose and habituate them to the point that we could actually bushwalk with them. And I've tried with limited success because I just don't have the, the time to be consistent with them. And you've got to find where they go to bed at night and it's actually it's, it's a difficult thing to do short of feeding them, which obviously we don't want to do. I don't want them to associate me with food. But I want to see how close... I mean, he's not even looking at me half the time now. Let me see if I can sneak a little bit closer. You see, the problem is they're comfortable because we never actually walk directly at them. I have a feeling if... I mean, now, even as I stand up, because my shadow's about to touch it, one of those weird things you don't think to be aware of in the bush unless you've walked a few times and made a few mistakes. You don't think to be aware of your shadow and the movement of your shadow, particularly in the late afternoon. Hi, buddy. I'm not really talking to it. Just making generic squeaking sounds that sound, if you concentrate really hard, might sound like a dwarf mongoose. And it's worked for me in the past in the vehicle to get them to come out and say hello. So I've narrowed the distance now by about two meters. Now, Anya, you say that you haven't seen a dwarf mongoose in a while. I have to say, our sightings have been few and far between of these little chaps. I think it's just the long grass, to be completely honest with you, Anya. No reason other than the grass is so long. We hear them all the time, but we only really see them when they pop themselves either out onto the road or onto a slightly higher termite mound. Otherwise, they disappear. They're so incredibly tiny. And just to give you a sense of perspective for our new viewers, these little chaps are probably the length of my forearm, from the base of my palm, where it meets my wrist, to the crook of my elbow. They're tiny little creatures, and that's including their little tails. The smallest of all of our predators out here, or at least our mammalian carnivores. Hi, little chap. Oh, hello, number two. Now, Shamsun, you want to know whether or not we could use Ronald the Rover to habituate the mongoose. Shamsun, the nice thing about dwarf mongoose is they're actually so curious and actually quite intelligent that, yes, I believe that we could. In fact, it could be potentially Ronald's new friends. I think Ronald would have a great time with a group of dwarf, dwarf mongoose. He might not be able to keep up with them, but... Shamsan, that's actually, I mean, we know that this business lives around the waterhole, the Juma waterhole. We've seen them many, many times. Now we just have to get lucky with Ronald, because bear in mind that Ronald has a limited radius um, where he can go, depending on where we set up the, the whole system. So we have to get lucky. The mongoose have to be there first. Ronald will just have to be patient. 
Sometimes when you make new friends, patience is a virtue. Like now. I'm making new friends, now I'm gonna have to crouch, because otherwise my shadow's gonna touch that second one and they're gonna panic. But now I look like I'm creeping up on them. I'm not. That's why I'm talking. Close the distance even more. I'm now about four meters closer than I was, and about six meters away from them. Geeky Beth, you say apparently pet rats can respond to their names. Pet mongoose can too. Um, they most definitely can learn their own names, um, or at least the sounds of their own names. Oh, don't go to bed yet. We haven't finished making friends. Oh, bye. Almost bye. I knew a mongoose called Goose. I actually looked after a mongoose called Goose. Many of you know the story of Goose. Goose ultimately ended up dangling from my septum between my nostrils. It was excruciatingly painful. But they do know to respond to their names. He used to walk into the garden and go, Goose! And Goose would come running along out of nowhere, shoot up your leg and climb into your sleeve. She was terribly sweet, if, you know, when she wasn't using her teeth. I had got off easy. My friend Steph ended up with Goose hanging from her eyelid. They don't really make good pets at all. And we don't encourage the keeping of pets as wild, or wild animals as pets. But there's no reason why we can't get a little bit closer now that the other one's out. Just keep my shadow down while they're distracted. Hi guys. Oh, too focused on me. Yes, Alice, what can I do for you? <laughs> ah, that is what Alice wanted me to let you know. It's that James is back with our incredibly endangered dogs.